understand what it is. You know. I think he's back. Hi, Professor Kramsky. Um, I was actually going to ask about the Goldstone report, but that got tackled right off the bat. So um, forgive me if this question is a little improvised. But um, um, right after 9-11, um, you and Christopher Hitchens had a sort of dispute in the nation. And, um, you know, he sort of accused you of being an apologist for Islamic fundamentalism. And you accused him of you know, um, using these horrible acts to justify U.S. foreign policy. Um, but my focus is um, more his um, um, Hitchens' staunch secularism and um, those of other um, so-called new atheists like Sam Harris, who seem to have the staunch secularism, which I personally agree with, but use it to justify, um, you know, an aggressive foreign policy. So. I'm just thinking of how to word this as a question. Um, do you see a way to rec not reconcile? Do you see a way to um, sort of um, uh, separate the um, staunch secularism of um, Harris and Hitchens from their uh, warmongering and, uh, in Harris's case, outright support for torture? Mm -hmm. Well, there are, maybe I can take that, yeah. If I understood you, it's actually... No. No? Huh? What? What's going on? This is okay? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah. Uh, well, there are two questions, if I understood it. One is about the claim that I was justifying 9-11. Oh, no, that was... No. Well, why did, you, why did you bring up Hitchens? Well, because he's one of those atheists. What? Well, can I, can I skip the first part of the question? Because it's just a total fabrication, and there's no point wasting time on it. But uh, the second part, what about the secularism? Well, first of all, I, don't, I think that they are religious fanatics. They happen to believe in the state religion, which is much more dangerous than uh, other religions for the most part. So they, uh, both of them, happen to be defenders of the state religion, uh, namely the religion that says... Uh, we have to support the uh, violence and atrocities of our own state uh, because it's being done for all sorts of wonderful reasons, uh, which is exactly what everyone says in every state. And I, I don't regard, uh, that's just another religion, like the religion that markets know best. I mean, it doesn't happen to be a religion that you pray to every um, once a week, but it's just another religion and it's very destructive. Okay, so I'd like to uh, see if there's any questions in the East Common Room first. Are there any questions in the East Common Room? Yeah, one moment. So, well, we have enough time to take one question for each overflow room. So you just talk. Okay. Um, my question is a little bit separate from the topics of today. It relates to your work on linguistics. Uh, so, originally, um, when you attacked Skinner's behaviorist model of language acquisition, you did it on the basis that the poverty of stimulus required that we had some prior faculty in our mind that allowed us to learn language from limited examples. Do you think there's a similar argument or account of a common human morality can be given? And do you have such an account or you have an idea of what such an account would look like. Just to uh, respond, if, if you look at that, as far as the review of Skinner was concerned, uh, almost 95% of it was just running through claims that he was making and arguing that these are totally absurd based on nothing. I mean, I did at the very end of the review say, look, there's another way of looking at this, which comes out of mainstream biology. Uh, mainstream biology just takes for granted that every capacity, you know, your visual system, your ability to walk, uh, whatever it may be, is based on some genetic uh, property. I mean, that's not even discussed. And that's, in linguistics, it happens to be called poverty of stimulus, but it's universal. Uh, what it means is that uh, the kind of creature you are is not determined uh, by the uh, inputs. Like, you can't change a human embryo into a a cat embryo by changing around the nutrition 
in the, in the uh, uterus, you know, it's going to become a human being, you know. That's because it's built that way. Uh, that's just a biological truism. And it's presumably no reason to doubt that it's also true of language. I think it is. Uh, what about morality? Well, I think it's the same thing. Actually, that was pointed out by David Hume. He's, he is, you know, the leading empiricist, but there's a lot of confusion about what empiricism is. The empiricists like Locke and Hume and others, uh, contrary to illusions, they believed in innate structure. And the reason is they were not idiots. I mean, of course, everything that happens comes out of innate, in a large part, out of innate structure. Well, what about morality? Uh, Hume couldn't give much of a proof, but he said, uh, he just made some observations, which are correct. He said, uh, look, we're constantly making moral decisions in new situations. And they're pretty consistent, and other people pretty much comprehend them and so on. Well, if we're doing that, it must be that we have some principles that are lying behind it. And the principles can't be picked up by induction. In fact, in his view, nothing can. It's all what he called animal instinct. It's coming from animal instinct. That's what's now called genetic endowment. So genetic endowment is determining our capacity to gain uh, knowledge, understanding, uh, develop moral principles, and so on and so forth. And I think that's probably, I don't see how that can be false. Well, the next problem is to try to go on and find out what they are. Uh, well, there's plenty of work on that. That's in fact a large part of the content of the classical moral philosophy. And it's picked up again in modern work. For example, uh, John Rawls's famous theory of justice.